So we, today, this is kind of cool. We're going to look at, at limits and infinity. Is the, the topic of the topic du jour here. So let's let's ease into this by thinking about removable versus non-removable discontinuity. Just a quick reminder. Can you can you remind me? We talked about this what, probably a while ago. Do you, I don't know if it was before this week or pre roundup or post roundup. Removable versus non-removable discontinuities. What's a removable discontinuity? Did we ever talk about this? Did we not talk about that? I don't, we talk, talk about that? I don't, I don't think, think we, we ever did. did. Oh, maybe we didn't. <laughs> okay, then I'll tell you what, I don't even want to. Let's not even do that. Oh, all skip right. that. We're going to skip that. Uh, that makes things easy. Let's just jump right up to here. So so let's, <laughs> you know what, yeah, we'll, we'll deal with that later. It makes more sense later anyway. So definition of a horizontal asymptote. So a horizontal asymptote, we know what a vertical asymptote is, right? Vertical asymptote, we've already we've seen those. They they divide the function and you can think of a vertical asymptote as creating two completely different universes in the function. I mean they are completely separate, right? You'll get more of a feel for that later on in the course when we do kind of we enter more of the functional analysis part where we use calculus to analyze functions and it's then, then we'll become more acutely aware of how significant vertical asymptotes are. But you know what they are now. Horizontal asymptote is what it sounds like. It's the same type of thing. It's an asymptote. So it's a it's a line to which the function eventually adheres, but here's how it behaves. We have a functional asymptote we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals L if these, one or both of these things happens. We have an asymptote to the left if the limit of f of x as x approaches negative infinity equals L. Okay, we have a, uh, an asymptote to the right if the limit of f of x as x approaches positive infinity equals L. Okay, and if we have an asymptote on a shared asymptote if, if both of those limits are true at the same time. So what that might look like then, if we did a graph, so it might look like if this is, let's just say this is y equals L, then that's the line, y equals L. If we have horizontal asymptotes at both sides, for example, then it means that this function, we don't have to know what it does in here. You could do all kinds of crazy stuff, right? But as we go infinitely far to the left or infinitely far to the right, the function is going to get closer and closer and closer to that asymptote so that the further you go to the right, the closer the function gets to L, and the further you go to the left, Let's say it's coming from this direction, maybe, the closer it gets to L. Okay? Can you cross a vertical asymptote? No. You really can't, can you? You can't cross a vertical asymptote. Because that's a discount, it's a place where the function is undefined. So you can't cross it because you can't ever have that x value, right? Could you cross a horizontal asymptote? You can. You can. Let's, I'll give you an example. What if we did something like um, what if I did <coughs> this, this function, what if I define f of x equals 1 over x times sine x. Okay, let's graph that one. Okay, look what that does. 
as I zoom out, what's it doing? It's approaching, it's approaching zero. How many times does it cross the asymptote? Infinite. An infinite number of times, right? But it is approaching the asymptote. So let's let me do that one more time. So sorry, yeah. Let's graph the asymptote. There's the asymptote it approaches, right? So there, there's kind of a weird example, but it's a good example of, of a shared horizontal asymptote. Okay? So you can cross a horizontal asymptote. No big deal. Take a picture of that. Just for your notes. There you go. Okay. So, you got a sense of what a horizontal asymptote is. Just a couple quick, just a theorem, just a couple quick relationships we, we want to be aware of as we move forward here. So does this make sense just intuitively? The limit of some constant divided by x to the r as x approaches infinity is zero. And or if I approach positive or negative infinity it's zero. Think about that for a second. Somebody just give us a as lucid a possible of a as possible of explanation of why that's true. <coughs> Think, why would that fraction be forced to zero? Okay, yes, sir. Um, I guess, like, the bigger number that's on the bottom, like the smaller fraction, is going to be. So, if you get an infinitely big number on the bottom, it's going to be. So a fraction would go to zero if, if the bottom got infinitely big and the top did not, right? If the bottom approached infinity and the top did Well, if I've got x to some power, it doesn't matter what the exponent is. If x is going to infinity, then x to any power is also going to infinity, isn't it? Right? And so that's going to that's gonna push that fraction down to zero, so shrink it down to zero. Whether the number that we're taking to a power is positive or negative makes no difference. Okay, so that one we, we can check off. What about this one? Uh, oh, so by the way, this this second one we got to be a little bit careful about this. Uh, the second limit's only defined when x is 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 less than zero, right? Okay, so if we were going to try to, well, but we're going to negative. We're going to negative infinity anyway, so yeah. who cares? I mean, we're just saying that as as we approach. When we get a situation like this, what we're getting at here is if we have a bigger power of x on the bottom than we do, well, I wouldn't even say that again. We have a power of x on the bottom and not the top. Whether I go to positive or negative infinity, that's going to shrink the fraction to zero. And I think we're good with that. Okay, what about this other one? The limit of e to the x as x approaches negative infinity equals zero, and the limit of e to the negative x as x approaches infinity equals zero. Well, let's, let's just dissect those just a little bit. How about this one? If x approaches negative infinity, and I tried to evaluate that directly, I'd get something goofy like e to the negative infinity. And, and take this with a grain of salt. You know, we mathematicians do this sometimes where we'll plug infinity in, but that's really not technically okay to do. Infinity's not a number. But when I plug in infinity, what do I really mean? Any number. I, I, yeah, I just mean a, a, an example of a really, really, really big negative number in this case. Right? We're just seeing what the trend is. We're thinking about this almost numerically in a way. If I plug in really big negative numbers, what am I going to see happen? Okay. Well, how could I rewrite? What's a negative exponent in terms of a positive exponent? It's 
something like that. Yeah. Okay. And what if we look over here? If I have uh, e to the minus x is 1 over e to the x, right? If I'm evaluating that at <coughs> infinity, they mean the same thing, don't they? Yeah. Okay, doesn't that make sense that that's going to go to 0? E is a number bigger than 1. If I take a number bigger than 1 to any power bigger than 1, what's going to happen to it? Getting bigger. 1.1 to the 100th power ends up being a pretty big number, actually, right? 1.1 squared is a very big, but 1.1 to the 100th power, you start to get into bigger numbers. Okay, so this one probably also makes sense, okay? All right, let's work with these a little bit. Let's try some limits here. So what's the limit of the function 5 plus 3 over x squared as x goes to infinity? Well, what's the limit of 5 as x goes to anything? 5. How about this other part, though? The limit of 3 over x squared as x goes to infinity. Well, that's just an example of this first theorem, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So that's going to go to 0, right? Everybody see that? The bottom is yeah. going to explode. The top is not. And so here's how, here's how I like to write that. It goes to 0. That's pushed to 0. So our answer is just 5. Okay? What about the bottom one? The limit of 3 over e to the x as x goes to infinity? Zero. 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 But the bottom, once again, is going to zero. Okay, that's just a straight example. Let's look at some more interesting ones. Yeah, something like that. Is it going to be? We want to take a stab at what the eventual answer might be. Now, this isn't, a, this isn't a one-step problem. We have to do some stuff to get this answer. We're going to come up with a, with a general rule for rational functions like this. And, and keep in mind what a rational function is. Right now, we're going to focus on rational functions, which is the ratio of polynomials. Okay? So what could we do to get to this answer? Let's go through some algebra that, where we can lean on the stuff that we already talked about, the theorems we already talked about. Uh, and then when we're done, maybe we could, hindsight's 2020, we could look back and say, well, maybe we could have just sort of finessed our way through this, too, by thinking about, about the way that the x's are going to infinity. So what if I did something like this? What if I were to factor out an x from the top and the bottom? Okay. And I picked the x because x is the biggest term in the weakest, it's the biggest power in the weakest polynomial. Okay. So if we factored out an x, I could also get the same result by factoring out an x squared, by the way. Either way would be fine. But if I factor out an x, I have to keep my limit notation. I haven't evaluated the limit yet. On the top, I've got x times what? Yeah, it's a little strange. But we can do this. Can. When I factor out an x, think what I'm doing. Now, listen carefully to this statement, because this will this will stay in your memories. When you factor out an x, you're just dividing an x away from each term. So 5 over x. So 5 over x. Yeah. Okay, on the bottom, if I factor an x out, what am I left with? 3x plus 1 over x. Plus 1 over x. Okay, good. This is just Okay, so. That's <laughs> crazy. So now, algebraically, I could trade this limit for a new limit that agrees with it every place except at zero, right? I could cancel out those x's algebraically. That's fair to do. 
Okay, and now what happens if I evaluate this stuff? Well, if I evaluate this limit as x approaches infinity, what's going to happen to that one? What's going to happen to that one? Zero. That's going to be a 2. What's going to happen at that one? It's going to infinity, right? So what's going to happen? I'm going to get 0, aren't I? Right? I end up with the limit of 2 over 3x as x approaches infinity, and we know that limit to be 0, right? Okay, I could have, the, just, just to show you here, there's multiple ways to do this. I could have also factored out an x squared. I almost like that way better. If I factor out an x squared, on the top I'm left with, if we agree, 2 over x plus 5 over x squared. Yes. Yeah. On the bottom, yeah. I've got x squared times 3 plus 1 over x squared. Good. As x approaches infinity, I can cancel the x squares, and now look what happens. I end up with 0, 0, 0. So I get 0 over 3, which is 0. Either way, I get 0. OK? All right, let's try another one. Any suggestions about what that one might be? With all the dust cells. Thirds is getting right. Let's look at the math here. Okay. If I factor out an x squared, top and bottom, on the top I'm left with good. Bottom Okay, so the x squares cancel, and now we can evaluate the limit. As x goes to infinity, that term goes to 0, that term goes to 0, and all I'm left with is a 2 on top and a 3 on the bottom. Okay? What about this one? What do you think is going to happen here? Make some suggestions here. What can I do? Factor out x squared. Okay, I could factor out an x squared. That'll work. So if I take an x squared out on the top and the bottom, what do I get on the top? 2x plus 5 over x squared. Okay, on the bottom. squares cancel. So if I evaluate this limit as x goes to infinity, that's going to go to 0, that's going to go to 0, and I'm going to end up with the limit of 2x over 3 as x goes to infinity. Well, what's the limit of 2 thirds times x as x goes to infinity? Infinity. So that's a, that's a classic case where that limit doesn't exist, right? Okay, that one blows up, right? So, could we have maybe finessed our way through that? Let's go back and look at these examples one more time. We probably could have. As x approaches infinity, the top is approaching infinity, but the pot, the bottom is approaching infinity. How much faster? Two. Not twice as fast. No, infinity. Infinitely, infinitely as fast. Yeah, I mean, it's going right because I've got an x squared on the bottom and I've got an x on the top. So they're both going to infinity, but because the bottom is getting there so much faster, it's going to dominate and, and the whole thing goes to, goes to zero. Right? And that seems weird to say. Talking about infinity can give you a hit it. I mean, we, we could literally just spend all year talking about infinity and never, never do the same thing twice. Uh, it's can you have sets bigger than infinity? You can. I'll prove it to you. 
Let's take the set of infinity is infinitely big. It's well, okay, but but all infinities are not created equally. Right. If, if we take the set of oh. integers, what if you have infinity to the infinity? Here's an easy one to do. Let's take the set of integers on the number line. How big is that set? The set of integers is how, how big is the set? How many integers are there? Four. No, I mean just, it goes on forever. The set of integers okay. is infinite, right? How am I supposed to? Okay, so now so let's let's take the set of of all rational numbers between zero and one. Between zero and one, how many rational numbers are there? An infinite, right? Yeah. Right? Well, wouldn't you agree that the set of integers is a subset of the set of rational numbers? So then the set of rational numbers is definitely bigger. It has to be bigger. Because there, I could, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between all of the elements in the set of integers and, and uh, elements within the set of rational numbers, but there's all these extra numbers in the set of rational numbers that don't appear in the set of integers. So without a doubt, the set of rational numbers is a bigger infinity than the set of integers. Okay? Make sense? Yes. You could also look at natural numbers. Natural numbers just start at one and go up to infinity, right? There's an infinite number of natural numbers. What's the set of whole numbers? Whole numbers include what also? <laughs> it's been a while. This is not because that big a deal. Whole numbers include zero, right? Natural numbers don't include zero. So the set of natural numbers is infinite. The set of whole numbers is also infinite, but it's one bigger than the set of natural numbers. Because once again, I can draw a one-to-one. -one. This is kind of a cool line of reasoning, and this is what you do like in set theory. If you're going to be a math major, this is something you talk about. We can, we can talk about the set of natural numbers, call that N, and the set of whole numbers is W. Well, that's just one, two, three, etc. The set of whole numbers is zero, one, two, three, etc. Well, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between all those elements, right? But I get this additional one element in the set of whole numbers. So even though they're both infinitely big, the set of whole numbers is one bigger than the set of natural numbers. How weird is that? Is, is infinity a number? No, it's not. It's not a set number, and yet we can still say that the set of whole numbers is one bigger than the set of natural numbers. Pretty bizarre. Okay? All right, so we could have we could apply that, that, that reasoning. In this case, we could have said, okay, we know that the top and the bottom, uh, you know, we can see that the x squareds are going to cancel, that they're both going to infinity equally fast, except actually not quite. The bottom one is going three halves as fast as the top one, right? But they're both, but they're going to stay at that. I don't want to say it that way. That's not a good way to say it. The ratio of those two numbers is always going to be the same. That's a better way of saying it. Okay? And so we, we get a finite answer. It's two-thirds. Even though they both are going to infinity, they maintain the same ratio the whole time. Okay? And then in this one, pretty clearly, the top one is a more powerful polynomial, so it's going to infinity infinitely faster than the bottom one. And so it's going to, the whole thing's going to get infinity. Okay? All right, so we can distill this down to some guidelines. I didn't pick those three examples just randomly. I picked them to be representative of all rational functions where the bottom is more powerful than the top. It's a higher order polynomial. The orders of the polynomials are equal or the top polynomial is a higher order. <clears throat> so we know that if the, always if the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, then the limit of the rational function is zero. And by the way, did it matter if I was approaching positive infinity or negative infinity? Didn't make any difference, did it? I could have replaced, in each case, I could have replaced this with x approaches plus or minus infinity. The result's the same. Right? 
Okay. <clears throat> so we, we know that if the bottom is is bigger than the top, numerator is less lesser order polynomial, the rational function goes to zero. If the orders of the polynomials are equal, then it's always going to approach the ratio of the leading coefficients. Isn't that what we saw? If we could have looked right here and seen that that's going to be our answer, two thirds, right? And of course, if the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator, then it doesn't exist. It's going to explode. Okay. So, what about this guy? That's what I was just about to ask. It's going to explode, then. Right? Okay, so that's one where it doesn't exist. Okay. Explosion in space. What that one? It doesn't exist. We'll come back to those. I don't know if I'll get to them today. Let's look at this one. Okay, what about that well, sign though? Yeah. That's not a polynomial. So this doesn't strictly follow the guidelines that we just placed. This is a slightly Do different kind of function. Are we approaching infinity? Or? Uh, yeah, let's take the limit. <laughs> Make it sure. No, oh, that's a good question. Come on, Lane. Okay. approaches plus or minus infinity. Okay, what's what's sign doing? It's less than it's zero. 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 Well, it's zero. Zero. if we just focus on on, yeah. on just this part of the function, yeah. sine of x squared makes it look complicated, but it doesn't matter. I mean, if I what's the sign of anything is always going to have values that are going to be limited, right? They're going to be bracketed between what two values? One and negative one, right? Yeah. Everybody agree? Yeah. So because this this function right here has a prescribed ceiling and a floor, it's never going to get, it can't get infinitely big or in the positive or negative direction. We can ignore that, right? Because the dominant behavior is occurring from here, right? Because the top is going to infinity and so is the bottom, right? In the limit that x goes to infinity, that's insignificant, and really all that matters. I could write it this way: the limit of f of x as x approaches plus or minus infinity is equal to the limit of 2x over x as x approaches plus or minus infinity, right? Because this just, this is insignificant. As x gets really big, that's just background, right? But what is that limit? Two. Yes? I was like, if infinity is it like a set number, like, you know, if different, can you cancel infinity and stuff? No, you can't. That's a good question. You can't cancel infinities. If you get, if you get a limit that comes up to be infinite over infinite, infinity over infinity, that's another indeterminate form. So the, we saw the indeterminate form zero over zero. There's a whole host of indeterminate forms that you learn to deal with in calculus, and that's one of many. Is infinity divided by infinity? It could be anything, and we've seen that. Yeah, we? we've seen that if we have infinity over infinity, if we tried to evaluate these directly, we would have gotten infinity over infinity, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing here, and same thing here. And yet we got three completely different kinds of answers. So if you see something where you try to evaluate it directly and it's infinity over infinity, once again, that means more work. Okay? Because we got to establish, well, what is really going on here? Good question. Okay, what about that one? This is probably the last one we'll get to today. Okay, is that a rational function? It's not, is it? It's not a rational function. So, I'll do a more vivid, I wonder if I have that thing saved. When do we get out of here? 25. 25. Let me just see something real quick. And this is kind of, I mean, this is, I mean, that was 